especially for us because um, we've been studying the Gospels on Sunday nights and Wednesdays. So the people that come here on a regular basis will know exactly what I'm talking about because a lot of times it gets a little frustrating on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights because we're back and forth and bouncing in between all these different things. So I'm going to try to keep that down as much as possible today. However, um, we will be moving around a little bit through the scriptures today. But we're going to start in Matthew 24 and verse 3. So hopefully you found your places there. And um, really what I want to do is I want to settle a lot of things in your mind about what the scriptures tell us and about what the signs are at the end times. Um, what does the Bible say about the second coming of Christ? And the real reason why is because we know there's going to be false prophets and false Christs out there. And all these different things that are going to try to confuse you and twist it all up and distort it and claim dates and times as we've seen before and all this kind of stuff. So we're going to try to settle that. So uh, we're going to go through all these signs of the end times because I really feel the time is fast approaching. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into the scriptures. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3. It says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of the coming of the end of the world? So his disciples come to him and they start to ask him, What is the sign going to be in the end of the world? And in verse 4 it says, And Jesus answered unto, and said unto him, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And I want to source this, as I said before, and I'll try to bounce through between these two things. But, but I want to show you something that's really, really sad. You want to know something? I went into the wrong place. Not really, but I wanted to show you something first. All right, so look at this here. What is this website called? It's called Wikipedia. How do you like that? So first source we're going to go to is Wikipedia. How, how many of you guys use Wikipedia? Yeah. I mean, isn't that awesome that you can yeah. use that? All right, well, here's the thing. These are the first confirmed people. All right, the first thing I'm going to show you is, if you can see it on the screen, in the 18th century, there was, it can you, I don't know if you guys can see that, hopefully you can. It goes in the 18th century, there's only one, right? And that's Anne Lee. And she was the founder of the leaders of the Shakers. They're both not talking about her. But it says that her followers referred to her as mother, believing that she was a female incarnation of Christ in her. This is the first one. Get this. She didn't claim to be Christ. Her followers claimed that she was. All right, now we go to the 19th century. Uh oh, look at this list. It's growing. John Nicholas Baum, he claimed to be the savior of the world. Arnold Potter claimed to be Jesus Christ, entered into the body. Um, Jones Berry, I mean, look at this list. It starts getting bigger and bigger. All right. All right, so that's how many were in the 19th century. Here's the 20th century. Now, this is really disappointing. If you look at these things, too, you can pull this stuff up when you get back home and research this stuff. But look at this list now. It's getting extremely larger. Look how many people here are claiming to be Christ, according to the Wikipedia website, in the 20th century. How sad is that? Did you realize there's that many people out there claiming to be Christ? Now we're in the 21st century. And there's, there's not as many yet, but I have a funny feeling a lot more about to come out. But anyway, I just wanted to show you this. So the scriptures tell us what's going to take place. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. How many people, how many of these people had followers and had a lot of followers? What a sad reality. These people, and the first one in the 18th century, her followers were one of the ones that actually started calling her Christ. She didn't actually Again, this all makes sense. So now these people are starting to actually claim their Christ. Now we're starting to see a lot more of it being a little bit more prevalent, though, than it was before. Because in the 19th century, in the 18th century, you didn't really hear so much about it. It wasn't such a big deal. But now you're starting to hear a lot more of it. It's being covered in the news and a lot more is going on. So that's the first thing I wanted to cover. So there's a lot more people now that are actually claiming to be Christ. When I was talking about this, a lot of people said, I didn't realize, and as I was going through this, I was talking to some of my family members, I talked to Tisha and my sister and different people, and they said, I didn't realize there's so many people claiming to be Christ. There's a lot. There's a lot more than we think. So I wanted to share that with you because one of the first things that goes into talking about is that we're, we're to be careful not to believe what everybody says of who Christ is. We will know when Christ comes back. And there's going to be a distinct way that we're going to know when Christ comes back. We'll probably cover that next week because I've got a lot of material to cover this week. So hopefully we'll get into that next week. Alright, so continuing down through here, in verse 6 it says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not 
trouble. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. How many words do we hear now? For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. I want to show you a couple more now at this point. So the first one is this one here. What is this? Have you guys heard about this? The love outbreak. The crazy thing about this is you're starting to see a lot more sicknesses and a lot more illnesses. It's talking about the number of people that are breaking out with this different disease. Here's the worst thing about this. If you've been reading about this or researching about this, there was a couple people that came back to the United States from having this, and it's very serious. It's treated very serious. There's no cure for it at this point. So most other diseases and things like that, there's a cure for it. Even cancer they can treat in some cases. Unfortunately, not in all. But in a lot of cases, they can. Well, in this year, unfortunately, there is no cure for it. So this sickness is a very serious thing. So there was a couple people brought back to the United States. They were completely quarantined before they even got back here. And here's the sad part. What if that outbreak were to happen here? Because you're seeing thousands and thousands of these people dying from this thing. And it just continues to rise. So I wanted to show that one there. That's one thing I wanted to show. I'm going to close these out as I go so it makes it easier. How many of you guys remember this? Remember the big, huge earthquake that caused the big tsunami that ripped across the low and then just completely destroyed a big place? Do you realize that documented, there's a documented axis shift of the earth from that? Did you guys hear about that in the news when it occurred? It shifted the axis of the earth. It was confirmed by NASA and confirmed by a lot of different well, I wanted to show you this for a reason. This here causes a lot of different things. It causes an axis, an axis shift, um, which causes historic tsunamis and quakes, rising sea levels, increased humidity, melting south pole ice, alters planetary balance, increased evaporation, equals increased precipitation. Um, it talks about how the sun is further now and, and closer during certain times. Um, it's hotter during the summer, it's colder during the winters as a result. Bizarre global weather and catastrophes. Are you seeing all these things? Yeah. Have you noticed this in the news? Right, look at this. This is what's really crazy. And this is why I really wanted to cite this one. Look at this. In 1973, there was 5,000 earthquakes. In 1983, there was 10,000. You see a, a trend here? What happened to that trend in 2013, 10 years later? And it says 2013 had more than double the annual earthquake total rate of 40,000 annual. So more than double what they expected. So there's a lot of things that are occurring that are causing a lot more earthquakes, a lot more serious, serious storms. This is all starting to make sense now. Here's the thing that people don't realize. What do scientists always try to do? They try to take this and throw it out. Right? How long have they been trying to do that? We look at these scriptures and it's amazing how these things are predicted and they talk about it. This book was written how long ago? Everything that it says in here is starting to happen. It's not. All right, so let's go on to the next one. I want to show you something else. How many do I have to go through this for? All right, now here's the next one. This is just a little bit more. This is CNN World that says the Earth's um, axis moved. It shifted about eight feet. Um, and this talks about a little bit about it. I just want to show you this because it cites that um, there were some global authorities and things like that that had mentioned this, um, which is amazing. But here's the last one I'm going to show you. And this is actually NASA's website. All right, now, it says in here in March of 2011, there's a huge earthquake. I don't know if you can read this right up there, so I'm going to read a little bit of it to you. Um, it says the calculations shifted the, the, the position of the Earth's axis um, about 17 centimeters. Hold on, let me go back a little bit further. About 17 centimeters towards 133 degree east longitude, if you can see that there. The Earth's figure, figurative act, or figure axis should not be confused with the north-south axis. They're offset by about 10 meters or 33 feet. But watch this. The shift in the Earth's figure axis will cause the Earth to wobble a bit differently as it rotates. Are you seeing this? But it will not cause a shift in the Earth's axis in space and different things, but it causes the Earth to wobble a little bit differently. All right, now, I want to show you something. So let's, continue where, uh, let's continue forward. If you want to go to, with me, we're going to go to Isaiah 24 and 20. What's Isaiah known for? Prophecy. Isaiah 24 and verse 20 is really amazing. So if you're going there, that's great. I'm going to go ahead and read this real quick. So as you're going there, if you want to write these notes down, there's a note sheet in your, in your bulletin. You can write this down. 
It says, the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. It shall be moved like a cottage, and the transgression there shall be heaven upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. What is that saying? The earth is going to reel to and fro. It's going to wobble. And here's the thing. These earthquakes have actually caused the earth's axis to shift, which is causing the earth to what? What did it say? It's, like, it's causing it to wobble. So here's another scripture that's been fulfilled. Now, I'm not saying, and I'm not trying to say that Christ is coming back tomorrow. All I'm starting to say is we need to start to pay attention because we're starting to fulfill a whole lot of scriptures here in Matthew. All right, so we're going to turn back to Matthew again. I just wanted to show you that scripture there. And um, continuing along in verse 9, it says, And they shall deliver you up to the afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hanged of all nations for my name's sake. Who is he talking to? He's talking to the world, talking to Christians. He's talking to Christians. And he says, you're going to be uh, persecuted and afflicted, and he's talking about all these things that are going to take place. Now, I can't show you most of the pages I came across, and the reason why is because I knew today that there would be kids here and children in here. But if you were watching my Facebook and saw the video I posted, there's a lot of affliction going on around the world with Christians. However, I did have one that I did want to show, and um, I just want to bring this one up real quick. It says, in more than 40 nations around the world today, Christians are being persecuted for their what? For their faith. It says, in some of those nations, it's illegal to own a Bible. If you share your faith in Christ, oh wait, what did it say? But anyway, yeah, so it's, and here's a list of a lot of the countries where it's take, where all this is taking place. If you start to look at the list of these places, where is a lot of that? In the Middle East. And that's very important as well. We're going to see why in a minute. But there's a ton of Christian persecution going on around the world today. And here's the thing that's amazing about that. Is over here in the United States, a lot of times it's so easy to forget about what's really going on. Because we're still free here. But do you know that they're planning to attack the United States? They are planning to. And they've already confirmed that there's a lot of them here. A lot of the ISIS group is here in the United States or claims to be. And they're fine, starting to find them. They're starting to realize they are here. But it's so easy to say, oh, that's over there. That's over there. We need to worry about that. And some people even say, well, I don't, I don't really want to hear about that stuff. Because we don't have to worry about that. And I don't want to hear about the glory stuff because that's not what really God's all about. God's about grace and about deliverance and all this stuff. I want, to you, I want to tell you something right now. Before the deliverance, there has to be a problem. Deliverance don't come without a problem. So if you've lived your life as a Christian and you've never had a problem and experienced deliverance, you're doing something wrong. You need to wake Satan up and shake him by the shirt tails and do something to get him on your track. Because really, in all reality, you should be facing Satan to some degree. We need to have that deliverance. We need to go through the trouble times and experience that deliverance. And it's really amazing. But here's just something I wanted to share with you. And um, we'll continue going along forward. And it says in verse 10, And there shall be many afflicted, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. We don't even need a website for this. We don't even need a website for this. Think about this. School bullying. School shootings. Guns and weapons in the school. Our youth are starting to become extremely violent nowadays. Gang violence. Serious crimes. But what's another thing they talk about is the worst. Families turning violent on family members. Families suing one another. Sons and daughters turning against their parents and divorcing their parents. How is that possible? All these things you see in the news, it's actually occurring. Mark 13 verse 12, if you want to turn there, Mark 13 verse 12 shares a little bit about this. And if you look at what this is talking about, it's exactly the parallel of this scripture here. And so if you want to go back and read that and, and see that a little bit closer, then that's great. But some of them, you know how a lot of times they don't exactly have the same thing Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, some of them will remember certain things, the other ones didn't remember. Um, yes, it is Mark 13 and 12. Chapter 13, verse 12. And it says, And now the brother shall betray the brother to death. 
And the father, the son, and the children rise up against their parents and shall cause them to be put to death. How sad is that? But stop and think about this. Have you started to see that? Man, I will tell you one thing for sure. My father was a retired Marine. And you didn't go against him, period. And, and when I was growing up, you just didn't do that. Because you respected your parents. Plus, if you didn't respect your parents, it was a little bit different back then. Because, boy, they laid on you. And we were talking about that the other day. When I was in church, when we would go to church, if we started to doze off or fall asleep like Stephanie is right now, if we started to do doze off or fall asleep, my father would just bop! And there was nothing worse than that. And the reason why is because when he hit you in the back of the head, you're half asleep, right? So what happens? Immediately you're like, whoa, what just happened? So it startles you. So your hands go flying in the air. And you think you're falling because you feel your head fall forward. And so you're really startled. And then when you realize there's 500 people staring you in the face, it's kind of a little embarrassing. But you do not to fall asleep. And you also do one thing for sure. You never talk back to your parents. And I will tell you this, talk back to my mother. That was the worst. If you talk back to my mother, my father was very close behind you. Believe me, there was a shadow over top of you within three seconds. And it wasn't coming to give you candy. I can guarantee you that. It was coming to get off of your ear or smack you upside your head or something. I guarantee you it wasn't a good thing. So, But it's amazing how different the times are now. You go to Walmart or go to any store after the service if you want to prove it and watch what happens. These kids are like they want a toy and they just will not listen. They want it and they want it now. But I don't want that one. I want this one. <laughs> it's amazing. So anyway, but it's amazing how that happens. Back then, we were just so happy to get what we got. And plus, in addition to that, it was a little bit different for our family because I had seven sisters and three brothers. So you really accepted what you got, and a lot of times it was handy now because you got whatever they decided they didn't want anymore because there were just too many people to be able to fight for them. Does that make sense? All right, so. All right, in verse 11, let's go back to the, where we were before, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. So false prophets are going to arise, right? We already covered the false Christ, and there will also be so many more false prophets. If you want to write down the scripture, we won't go there and cover it because it's got so much to cover today before I'm done. But 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through 3, covers that a little bit more in detail. But I do want to show you something that really irks me, and it should irk you, and I'm hoping it really does. So I'm going to go to this real quick, and I'm going to show you another website. And as soon as you see it, I hope it turns your stomach and makes you <laughs> nauseous. First look at the satanic monument being built for the Oklahoma State House. Have you guys heard about this? Nice. Oh, man, if you haven't heard, you need to hear about it. Something like this should, would not have been possible 10 years ago or even 60 years ago, but the, with the emergence of someone in the White House, we won't go there. A dark and sinister spirit has settled over America. Anyway, nice. the Oklahoma St State House in January, the Satanic Temple, announced plans to erect a monument glorifying the Dark Lord on the front of the Oklahoma State House. An indigo campaign was launched with what seems like a somewhat lofty goal of 20000 But by the time the donations ended, almost 30000 had been raised. And there you go. It's got children on both sides of it and a seat for people to sit on it and take their picture with it. And if that is not disgusting to you, I don't know what it is. There, and here's why they say they should be allowed to do that. What is the United States? Freedom of religion, right? So it's very difficult for them to stop this. And the reason why is, oh, I, I can go down a little bit further here. The reason they wanted to install this is because in 2010, Mike Ritz paid for the controversial statue with his own money. And what was it, if you guys know? It was the Ten Commandments that was placed on the lawn. Yeah. And so this is in response to the Ten Commandments that were placed on there. Anyway, I wish I could find that actual part of the article. But go back and look it up on your own. Oh, here it goes. The statue is a direct response to the state, state's envision, um, installation of the Ten Commandments monument outside the Capitol in 2012. The state representative paid for it with his own money. And now what's happened is they're saying, well, if you put that there, you're going to put this there, right? Of course. How do you stop that? They have a right. So what are you going to do now? Now you've got the tank damage. You pretty much got to let them put it there. And now it's in court and they're trying to fight all this stuff. So they're saying, well, nothing's going to happen until we go through court. But here's the thing. Would this have happened five to ten years ago? No. But now all of a sudden, what's happening? Well, it 
end up there? Have you seen the laws they're passing now? Yes. If it's not disgusting you, then this really should, and maybe it's time to start waking up Americans. But here's the problem. Can we stop this? Probably not. Here's the sad part of it. The sad part of it is this stuff is happening. The good part is, that means there's deliverance coming. That means there's deliverance coming. And I have a feeling I know exactly what it is when I finish with this. Hopefully you'll have a pretty good idea too. Alright, so, in verse 12, continuing along, it says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Look around. Love is failing. Love is failing. If you haven't noticed it, just pull up the statistics on marriages. Love is starting to fail. And we've already talked a little bit about it already. What are kids doing? They're turning against their parents. What are parents doing? Turning against their kids. That's not even possible. What are parents doing? Leaving their kids in the back seat of the car while they go shopping. How is that possible? How do you forget they're there? It's your kid. That's impossible. That should be completely impossible. But now what they're doing is telling you to leave one of your shoes when you get in the car, taking your shoes off and sit inside the stroller in the back, or inside the car seat, so you don't forget, and there's all these different things going on. But really, in all reality, it's just a sad time, because you, and if, especially if you're a female, you carried this child around for nine months, you would think it would be somewhat impossible to leave them sit in the car and not remember they're there. Plus, I don't know about you, but as soon as we pull up anywhere, Stephanie gets so excited, because she just likes to go anyway. If it's shopping, she wants to see the toys. If it's anything, if it's food, she wants her toys. If they come with the food or whatever. So. All right. So anyway, it's amazing how that can be possible. But I guess it can happen, especially if you're doing what? Got your cell phone glued to your ear. You don't even hear that kid. You just jump out of the car and you're talking on the phone and don't even realize there's anything else going on. How many times have you seen people completely oblivious to what's going on around because of the cell phone? Anyways, continuing right along. All right. It says here in verse 13, May he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be Sorry. saved. Who is he talking to again? Christians. He's saying the Christians that endure to the end, the same shall be saved. So, now here's the thing. A lot of people say, oh, does that mean you can lose your salvation? I do not believe so 100%. I've read a lot of the scriptures. I just don't think that it's possible. It says your sign is sealed into the day of redemption, and I believe that's true. Um, but anyway, so I think what he, more than what he's talking about here is endurance to the end is you want to stick with it to the end. You don't want to, what? Deny the Holy Ghost. You don't want to deny it because that is one of the unforgivable sins we mentioned we talked about and everything like that. Normally. So it's really, I think what he's talking about more than anything is denying the Holy Ghost and, and absolutely turning your back on God himself. All right. The last thing. Look at 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. So, I'm going to go there real quick. 2 Timothy. Okay, so 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. And this is important, too, because we've kind of talked a little bit about this, but I wanted to throw this in there. And when we're done with this verse, don't, don't close your Bibles from there and flip back right away, because we're going to look at something else while we're back here in 2 Timothy. All right, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 says, This also know that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own self. Covetous. What does covetous mean? Wanting everything your males have. Right? Boasters. What does boasting mean? I'm so cool. I'm so awesome. I'm so great. My Facebook page is better than yours. My status is better than yours. I got more likes than you. Right? Whatever. However it works out. Proud. Blasphemers. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Unholy. Without natural affection. Without natural affection. Loving things you have no business loving. Things that you weren't made to love. Things you weren't designed to love in the first place. False accused, no, truth breakers. What is a truth breaker? Somebody calls the truth and then breaks it, right? How crazy is that? False accusers. Incontinent or unable to control themselves. Fierce. Violent. 
despisers of those that are good. Are you serious? Are you seeing all this right now? Just look out in the world right now. All right, continue where we're at. Then flip over the page. It's going to be 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. And it says, For the time will come when they will endure, will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap up unto themselves teachers that have itchy ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. All right, flip your way back to Matthew because that's what we're going to end up at. No, we're not either. But that's okay. You can flip that way. What is this talking about? They're not going to even want to hear sound doctrine. They're going to turn their back on the scriptures. Instead of wanting scriptures, what do they want? Fables. They want Disney stories. They don't want to know about God anymore. Get them out of the school system. That's not even teach that anymore. Hey, let's take Christmas and throw that away and bring in Santa Claus. Let's take the cross and throw that away and bring in the Easter money. Let's take all these things of God and make them into fables. And let's just make it all a game. And here's another thing that Tisha and I were amazed by the other day is we took Tisha in, I mean, we took Stephanie in to get her teeth worked on. And when we're sitting there getting her teeth worked on, we pick up this book, this Bible book, so-called Bible stories. And we're sitting there flipping through it and reading it, and we were like, what? They took these words and made it almost sound like it's a storybook instead. And talked about how this kid was transferred by his dreams into another land, and he started seeing these things. Took the entire story and made it into a fable so that the kids read it, they don't even realize it's anything more than just a story. And so now what happens a lot of times, people say, Well, I don't know really so much the scriptures really real. I think it's just a storybook. And then and we wonder why. And we wonder why. Isn't that amazing? Alright. So now we're going to turn, because here's the thing. I want to go to Luke now and finish this up in Luke. And there's a reason why, because Luke ends this so much better. So we'll turn to Luke chapter 21 to finish this all up. It's like I said, if you go back and look at Luke 21 and you start reading the beginning of it, it wraps up almost exactly like the first one did. Luke chapter 21 starts and it says, you know, they, the disciples came to him and in verse 7 and he asked him, saying, Master, when shall we see these things? But what shall the signs be when these things shall come to pass? Does it sound a lot like Matthew? And they said, take heed, take heed, you be not deceived. So it starts sounding a lot like Matthew. We keep continuing right down through the scriptures. Nations will rise against nations, earthquakes, and diverse places, and famines, and all these different things, right? So it's the exact same thing as what we've read. The only thing is it ends a little bit better. So if you go down to verse 20. So Luke chapter 21 and verse 20 is where we're going to start it. Because we've already covered all this stuff in front of But I just love the way that Luke ends this. And it says in verse 20. And when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. When you see Jerusalem being encompassed with armies, what are these talking about here? What did the disciples ask him for? What the signs were of the times to come, right? The end times. And he says, This is one of them. And verse 21. Oh, wait, hold on. Before we go there, there's another slide I'm going to show you now. Alright, you ready for this one? What does that say on the screen? This is the Jerusalem Post. There's more people joining the fight against Israel. And they're calling more people in. And who's the silent person over there in the Middle East? Can you see him? Yeah. Hamas invites Hezbollah to join in fighting against Israel. And there's been mistakes, huge words that have been said by the leaders of this country against Israel. And that is not good. Because the Bible says that that's one thing that will not be forgiven. But anyway, so here's another one that talks about people joining the fight against Jerusalem, right? Which is what? What is in Jerusalem? Israel. So it says here that um, there will be armies that go to fight against, um, against Jerusalem. All right, and they continue into verse 21. It says, And let them which are in Judah... Flee into the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of them depart out, and let them not, and no, yeah, and let, them, and let not them that are in the countries enter here into. So where are they going to flee to? Where are the Christians going to flee? Have you seen this recently in the news? 
Where are they hiding? Where are they going? They're going into the mountains to hide from ISIS. Now, this is talking about, let them that are in Judea, Judea, where is Judea on the map? It's over top of Israel, right? Are they going into the mountains yet from Israel? Not yet. But they're going into it from all around those little areas, all surrounding that area. So, it's coming, trust me. So they're starting to drive the Christians up into the mountains to hide from all this persecution that's going on against the Christians. All right, verse 22, continuing along. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. So these are the days of vengeance against Christ, against Christians. Now what does the Bible say about people that are persecuting Christians? What does it specifically say? They're not persecuting Christians. They're not persecuting you personally. They're persecuting God. And they're going to have to deal with that. And it says, verse 23, But woe unto them that are with child, and them that give suck in those days, or nurse in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people. Why does it talk about that? Because when I first saw this, I was trying to think about this. Here's the reason why. Because what happens when you have a baby? What does the baby do? But it's nursing still. When it's time to nurse, what does it do? Oh, it tells you. It'll start screaming, right? And if you're not right there beside it, it'll give away your location. If you're hiding in the mountains or something like that, trying to be quiet, or hiding in the rooftops, there's another scripture that says, well, to them that are up on the roofs or hiding in the roofs or those that are hiding in the mountains. And it's talking about this because what are they starting to do? They're persecuting Christians. Who are they going after? after? Look it up online. Who are they going after? The women and children. Why are they going after women and children? Because it stops the, the child. It just stops them from growing up. What did Herod go after? Children. Anybody two years and under, he wanted, to, he wanted to wipe them out because he wanted to stop the line of Christ. Fortunately, well, actually, fortunately, actually, he didn't make it because that would have be been very bad. All right. So. These people are going to be trying to hide, and obviously, two reasons why I think that's, that's very important. Because if you have a baby that's that young, if you're pregnant or about to give birth, you're going to be screaming. <laughs> and if you did just give birth, the baby's going to be screaming. And you're going to need medical attention and all these kinds of things, which can be difficult to get at, because when you go in, they're going to start asking, are you a Christian? Yep, I'm a Christian. You've got to deny your faith. You're going to have to write that in there and say, no, I'm not a Christian, just so you can get medical attention. Because if you say you are, that's what does that make sense? All right. In verse 24, and they shall fall by the edge of the what? Are you reading the news? And shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. All right. What are we seeing right now? They're falling. Not by guns, but by the edge of the sword. It's amazing what they're doing. If you haven't been watching the news, watch it. I'm not going to be descriptive of that because there's young people in here that just know that they're falling by the edge of the sword. All right, verse. Am I stopping here? No. Verse 25. All right, now this is amazing. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. In verse 26. No, we're not going to 26 yet. All right, we're going to go to Joel. Joel chapter 2, if you're going there. If you're not, right, make sure you write that in your notes. You can look at this later. So, Joel chapter 2. Verses 30 and 31. Rather than just a man who are doing God. So in Joel chapter 2, verses 30, it says, And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Now, a lot of people get confused with this, and I went back and I was like looking this up. It says, I will show you wonders in the heavens and in the earth, and blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And I got to think about this blood and fire and pillars of smoke. What do those have in common? So I was pulling it up with the strongest components to go back into the original manuscript to try to figure out what this is talking about. Not talking about blood, it's talking about the Earth's own blood. It's talking about signs between the Earth and the stars and the firmaments and things like that. It's talking about the blood coming out of the Earth. What is the 
the blood coming on the earth? Love? Magma. Magma. This is actually talking about volcanoes. And they're going to spew out big volcanoes and pillars of smoke and fire. Does this make sense? Does it look like what we're seeing? And the sun shall be turned into darkness. The sun shall be turned into what? Darkness. And the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord to come. All right, let's go back to Luke. And I'm going to show you something here real quick. Look at this. I want to show you something. Did you guys see this the other day? Have you guys seen the blood moon that just yeah. happened? All right, now, I want to show you something. As you read this, it says, as many are speculating over the last week's blood moon and its significance, the founder of this forum, uh, forum on truth and culture is asking the question, will Jesus return in the next 18 months because there's a lot of feelings that that's going to happen? Do we know that? Absolutely not. But last week's lunar eclipse, more commonly known as the blood moon, is the first of four to come in the next year, which is called the Tetriad, which, there's, which is four in a row. It's called Tetriad. And they have happened before, but this is noteworthy because each of the four blood moons will happen on a Jewish holiday. How amazing is that? But let's continue looking forward because there's something really important about this. So they're going to happen on the Jewish holidays, right? Um, two during Passover and two during the Feast of Tabernacles. This phenomenon spurred a ton of people, including who's John Hayden? Does everybody know who John Hayden is? Yeah. He wrote a book about this and started publishing books about this and started talking about this because it's that important. All right, so continuing down, obviously they say, I have no idea these men will do anything with Jesus to earn. But obviously it would make sense, right? But I do know that a blood moon was associated with his death. When Peter preached in his Pentecost sermon, he cited Joel's prophecy, because Joel had prophesied that there would be one when Christ died, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the day of the Lord comes. And then obviously this happened whenever he died on the cross. That it happened. And so it says that. And you can go on. Now here's the thing. I think it's really important what they say here. This doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to come right now. Obviously, we don't know. It could be six months from now. It could be a year from now. We don't have any idea. But obviously these things are happening for a reason. And now to see them all fall, four of them fall on a Jewish holiday is pretty important. All right, and now we're going to go to the next one. Now watch this. What else did it say? It said... Look at this. I'm going to go back and read that to you again. In verse 25, it says... And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth great distress of nations. We see that with perplexity and the sea and the waves roaring. Have you listened to that when the tsunami came through? And we've seen a lot more activity in the water. Not just that one. There's been several now that have cast. I mean, the, the water just was churning like crazy. And when we were watching Shark Week this year, there were some of the boats out there that were saying, man, this is crazy. We've never seen water like this before. And there was one that the guy was actually starting to get sick. And it was pretty amazing. Um, but the waters are worse than they've ever been. The seasons are worse than they've ever been. The hurricanes, the earthquakes, all these kinds of things are worse than they've ever been. All right. So I wanted to show you this. But if you watch the videos of this, I think it's more important to know where did the water go. It destroyed Tons of towns. I mean, just came in and just ripped the towns to nothing. Does that make sense? All right. Now verse 26 in Luke. So hopefully you're back there. And it says, Men's heart failing them for fear, for and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Listen, do you fear what's coming on the earth? Have you been watching the news? Are you starting to think about what tomorrow's going to be like? Are you starting to think, I almost wish we didn't have a kid to come through for the generation after this generation because our generation over here is horrible. Let alone those ones over there and everything they're dealing with. Can you imagine having a Christian child in another country where they're persecuting them heavily? But can you imagine what this world's going to be like? Have you ever drove through Miami, stopped at a stoplight, and just feel like you should take off 
and not wait for it to turn green. I've been there. I've been in a couple cities. I used to run an auto glass company all over the place. And we would go into big cities to, you know, to get windshields replaced and to drop windshields off. And stuff like that. And I come back to the competition. I ain't never going to come there ever again. I'll send someone else. Because there's creepy people that just stand in the corners and wait for you to stop. And trust me, they'll jump in your car to give them a chance. chance. Alright, now we're wrapping it up. In verse 27, in verse 27 it says, and Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now listen, verse 28. And when these things, what's the word? Begin. Begin to come to pass. Then look up and lift up your head for your day of redemption draws nigh. Think about this. How awesome is that? Do you see these things happening around the world? Are you starting to see all the things that I just listed here actually starting to happen? I know as I sit there and I look about this, one of the reasons why I made this is because of some of the discussions we've had in here. And then the Lord just started laying it on my heart and started telling me this is the direction we need to go. Because why? Why did I say it the other day? A lot of you guys look at my Facebook and you say, hey, you know, this is wow, this is awesome that you say these things and things like that. And, and the reason why is because a lot of these things, I, you know, when God started revealing this on my heart, it came to mind to me more than anything is the fact that I think a lot of Christians are so callous to this that they don't even see it coming. Let alone the world. The world don't even see it coming. They don't realize what's really happening and what's really taking place. But here's the thing. This was written years and years and years and years and years ago. And it's so amazing when you get to look at it. Because Joel, we studied Isaiah, Joel, Matthew, Matthew, Luke, we were even in Mark. And here's the thing. How many of these people wrote these different things? Do you think they all sat down about together and said, hey, let's just make our notes all the same? We'll just write all the same so it just sounds good, right? Okay, even if they did, how is it that in the year 2014, all these things are starting to come to pass? Isn't that amazing? So I have one thing I want to show you to kind of wrap this up, and I want to show you a way that you can tell when Jesus Christ is going to come back. An easy way to make it make sense. So if you want a way to make it make sense, I can make it make sense to you. I gotta explain that. All right. So, how do we know? Jerusalem is under siege. Do you see that now? The earth is wobbling to and fro. We just confirmed that, that that's happening right now. Suffering is everywhere. Are we seeing this? We're seeing suffering all over the place. Financial stress. It used to be back in the day that what? The father of the household could financially provide for the family. Now try that. A friend of you, a person that just came here the other day for food, said that their husband had been working for this company for years. And all of a sudden, and he, and he was, his pay was high. So what they did is they told him, well, because your pay's high, we're trying to cut back payroll, your position's been terminated. But you can rehire back on, which will start at minimum wage. And he has how many families to support? How many, did he, how many kids? I think it was three or four kids in the car. But anyway, so now they're trying to find ways to make sense. All right, the next one. Unbelief is worldwide. Unbelief in Christ. We see that so much right now. Scoffers become bolder. We didn't cover too much of this, but there's actually scriptures that tell you that the scoffers are actually going to become bolder. Increase the number of disasters, natural disasters. Are you seeing this? This is where sexual desires are going to start to override sexual fulfillment. People are going to look to other things rather than to fulfillment. Have you noticed that? If we all have. Especially when it becomes an involved in family. That's just disgusting. Anyway, crime becomes more violent. Ostracizing Christians. The moon, the sun, and the stars are going to start to show signs. 
increase in knowledge. Daniel talks about this very specifically. And what's the last two nations fighting globally? And gospel going into all the world. Jesus is 